Well, good morning, everyone. So happy you're here to worship with us. Let's stand together and begin in worship. everybody on this uh, beautiful sunny day out. Um, no, hey, well, I'm glad you're here. Uh, we've been praying for you. Uh, you're not here by chance. In fact, this morning, our, our share team got to, to walk in the sanctuary and pray for every seat. And so as you walked in, just know that you've been, been prayed for this morning. So you're not here by chance. The Lord is, is going to do a work this morning in our hearts. I want to... Um, Welcome you, obviously, to Hebrew Baptist Church, where we exist to love God, love people, and make disciples. And I pray that your week has been, been great, despite today's weather. We are here to worship Jesus. Amen? Amen. I want to uh, just give you a quick uh, little insert about we have Easter flyers or Easter cards, postcards on every chair. These are for you, uh, sort of a challenge or an encouragement. Uh, we want to encourage you to invite someone to church. If you have a postcard, but you can give it to them and say, hey, we'd love to have you. All of our Easter services are going to be on here uh, on this one, except for our Thursday night. We're having a, uh, a Lord's Supper or Passover meal together here, and there's some information out front there. Well, hey, let's continue to worship this morning. Let me read to you Psalm 19, verses 1 through 3. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Pray with me. Father, we thank you so much that we're able to gather here today to worship you. Lord, my prayer is that as we come together to worship, that we would give you our burdens, 
just un, unleash all of our, our heartaches that we have. God, that we would give you all of those and that you, Jesus, would be exalted this morning, that you would be lifted on high, and that our worship this morning of you would be worthy of you. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and continue in worship.
I'm calling on the God of Jacob Whose love endures for generations I know that you will keep your covenant I'm calling on the God of Moses who opened up the ocean I need you now to do the same thing for me we sing this in faith sing oh God I need you oh God my God I need you oh God my God I need you now how I need you
chapter 11. It says, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. cry out to worship whose glory taught the stars to shine perhaps creation longs to have the words to sing but this joy is mine with a thousand hallelujahs we magnify your name. You alone deserve the glory, the honor, and the praise. 
honor and the praise Lord Jesus this song is forever yours a thousand hallelujahs and a thousand more as we worship and we think about our great God and Savior Jesus and we we, we don't have the words sometimes, at least I don't have the words to think about how much he deserves our praise. A thousand hallelujahs is not enough. A thousand more is not enough. For all eternity, you and I, as believers, as followers of Christ, we're going to be singing his praise because the lamb was slain. He took sin nailed it to the cross that you and I can have forgiveness and a right relationship with God. It's not that we're just forgiven, but now we have the ability to have a relationship with the Father. His love for you, his love for me knows no bounds. And as we come together to worship this great God and Savior, I pray that your hearts would be encouraged that whatever lies you're believing, that God doesn't love you, that he doesn't have mercy for you, that he doesn't have grace for you, would be cast to the wayside because it is evident that he loves us. The cross proves it. Come and we worship. We love you. We thank you for your grace and your mercy for us. And Father, as we as we come to continue worshiping through tithes and offerings, we pray, Lord, that you would be glorified. That you would take this offering, not just of our voices, but of ourselves, and use them for your glory. We thank you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. haven't noticed we're pretty excited about Easter this year. Uh, we have a lot of, a lot of great stuff planned, uh, starting with Palm Sunday and then Thursday, Passover meal in here. Uh, there's more details out in the uh, foyer. And of course, we're going to have a good Friday service. And then Saturday, we'll have Easter festivities going on. And then Sunday, a sunrise service, 7 a.m., then breakfast, Sunday school, and then our 10 a.m. worship service. And so there's a lot, a lot going on that Easter week, but we're so excited uh, to celebrate that with, with, with everyone. Uh, but you know, Easter is not just something we celebrate once a year. 
Well, no, we, we celebrate the fact that our Savior was risen every single day. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you to turn with me to Colossians chapter 3. We're going to be looking at verses 20 and 21. We're continuing working through Colossians. We're, we're getting there. We're almost uh, ready to, to close the, the chapter in Colossians and, and move on to where the Lord leads. But we're continuing uh, sort of part two, what it means to live out Christ-centered relationships in the home. Last week, we looked at uh, the relationship between husband and, and wife and, and how, that, how God has ordered that relationship and, and how we should live Christ-centered, gospel-centered lives in the relationship of a husband and wife. And, and really, it all stems back to Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, where Paul is admonishing the believers to take on the mind of Christ. He says, if then you have been raised with Christ, if you're a Christ follower, then Paul is speaking and saying, if that's you, now you're to take on the mindset of Christ. You are to think heavenly. You're to have a heavenly mindset in all things. And Paul is systematically walking through what it means to live a Christ-centered life in the midst of this world, in the church. And today we're looking at the household part two between children and parents. And so you might think, well, I don't have children Okay, well, um, maybe you know someone who does, and you can encourage them. You say, well, I'm not a parent. This doesn't apply to me. It will apply to you. Hopefully, I'm going to walk us through this passage. And what you'll see, here's what you're going to see. Paul is telling us, no matter who we are, what we do, we're called to live a Christ-centered life, a gospel-saturated life, no matter our context. Parents, single, children, Whoever you are, you are called to walk out the gospel. Let it bear fruit in your life in every context. Colossians chapter 3, verse 20. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come once again and ask that you would speak Oh, Lord, your people are gathered. Speak in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, first off, we see that Paul is addressing the family to be Christ-centered, be a Christ-centered family. And the first uh, people in this category he addresses is children. Paul is a, and you'll notice here, uh, I love what Paul's doing. He's addressing children, not just uh, because Christian parents have children. I love what O'Brien says. He's addressing children in the Christian household, but he is also addressing children as members of the church in their own right, as responsible persons within the congregations. One of the things that you hear often in ministry is that the, the youth, the children, are the future of the church. And in one sense, that's right. They are the future of the church. But on the other sense... We need to understand that they are the church right now. From the nursery to uh, the hundred-year-old, we are the church together. It doesn't matter your age. We together are considered the church, the called out ones. And what the church has to have, we must get from this mindset of silos, thinking in silos. What do I mean by that? Corey and I talk about this. Tyler and I talk about this a lot where we don't want to approach church in silos where, oh, that's children's ministry, that's kids' ministry, that's youth ministry. No, we're together, we're one. How do we approach church ministry holistically, together? I remember as a student pastor back in Florida, we had a meeting, a church council meeting one day, and and somebody was asking a question, and I I brought my advice, said, hey, well, I think this, and she said, oh, well, you don't matter, you're youth. I said, oh, whoa, hello, Um, nice to meet you. Uh, and, you know, just that mindset that, oh, well, that's, that's children over there, and that's youth over there. No, we're one. The church is one together. And you'll see all throughout the New Testament, Paul is encouraging older women to teach younger women, older men to teach younger men, this idea of discipleship. This means that all hands must be on deck. Amen. This means that some of you are, are, have, as Dr. Talbert says, less days in front of you than you do uh, and boy, how does he say it? I just mess it up. Some of us have more days in front of us than we do behind us. 
And some of us have more days behind us than we do in front of us. And sometimes the thinking is, well, I don't know, I don't have much to offer anymore. Oh, well, well, I've served and, and I'm getting to a point where, you know, I just can't do much. Brothers and sisters, you can do much. In fact, one of the things that you can do that greatly benefits our church and our people is pray. You might not be able to get up out of bed like you used to and, and, and walk like you used to and serve like you used to, but hear me, you can pray. You can lift up our church. You can lift up the children. You can lift up the youth. You can lift up the leaders. You can pray. I'll never forget my grandmother who is, is <clears throat> less days ahead of her in her 90s, late 90s. She says, Travis, I'm ready to go. I said, Grandma, you're, you might be ready, but the Lord's not done with you. And she goes, well, I just sit here all day. What am I supposed to do? I said, Grandmother, you have 13 great-grandchildren. Pray for them. She goes, well, I do. Well, keep praying for them. Lift them up. This is what God has called you to do right now in this moment is be an intercessor. Pray for them. Continue to lift them up. And I, I just remember leaving my grandmother and being encouraged because she was encouraged. It was like she, she remembered her purpose in a sense. Like, yeah, I have this family that I'm called to lift up in prayer. And so let me just go ahead and say that there are no silos in churches. We put silos on them, but we're one holistically together from the, the children, youth, adults, senior adults. We are one. And as a church, as we're moving forward in one body, we have to think like that. And so Paul is addressing children as members of the church in their own right. He's saying, children, obey your parents in everything. Now, what is obedience? Obedience is the simple process of hearing, understanding, and responding. Now, I'm going to give a couple examples from our home, and I want you to understand we are not professionals at all. In fact, we, we don't have this all figured out. And those of you with children, if you've had children, I think you would agree with me, we don't have this all figured out. There are no perfect parents. So what I'm going to share with you is some things that we've done in our home that seem to be working, but by no means are we the standard. I'm just going to go ahead and say that. You come to my house, you'll probably leave like, oh, we got to get out of there. It's a, whew, man, it's rough. Okay, maybe that's just me. Anyone else? Amen? Okay, a few of you. One of the things that we try to teach our children is this idea of listening and obeying, right? And so whenever our children are not listening and obeying, which happens frequently, we say, listen and obey. Now, usually it goes one ear out the other, but we want some, some, we're praying somehow that as we continue to say, listen and obey, that it sticks. That it just somehow just stops in the middle, right there in the middle, and they just say, oh, listen, hear, understand, and obey. Right? And this is what God is calling children. And by children, you know, sometimes we think, well, what does it mean to be a children? Well, I know in Jewish culture, uh, in the first century, Young boys didn't become men until their bar mitzvah. Bar means son, mitzvah is commandments. So son of commandments is this idea of them come, becoming a man. They are now accountable to the commands of God and responsible for knowing them. And in this culture, they were a full participant of the worship of God in the assembly. So children, what does it mean to be children? Well, I think what Paul is getting at here is that uh, children who are living in their household under their parents. Now, if you are married and you, the two have become one, Paul, uh, Genesis says that uh, the man leaves his family, clings to his wife, I don't think this applies to you in a sense where if your parents come to you and you have a family of your own, they say, hey, you need to do this and obey me. Just throwing that out there. You, you, you need to understand that you're one. And I see some, some parents here with their parents you know, just take that as you will. But God has always commanded children to obey their parents. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 12, the command, honor your father and your mother that, it, that your days may be long in the land and that the Lord your God is giving you. 
And in Exodus chapter 21, verse 15, actually ordered the death penalty for any child striking father or mother. Obedience to parents is really submission to God. Paul is saying that the obedience of children to their parents should flow from their submission to Christ. Parents and their relationships to their children was a big deal. You can see that all throughout the Old Testament from the Mishnah. Parents had a responsibility to instruct their children in the way of the Lord. But also, children had a responsibility to take care of their parents when they get older. And so, some of you young men and women, this was actually what took place in Judaism and in early Christianity. The care of aged parents was regarded as a religious duty, and their neglect was behavior worse than that of pagans. And so, you see this relationship, it's a big deal. In fact, Paul gives the reason why children should obey their parents in everything. And he says, for this pleases the Lord. This is the aim of everyone who calls Jesus Lord, to please him. And children can please the Lord by hearing and obeying their parents. Does that mean that there's ever going to be a moment when children should not obey their parents? This might sound bad, but yes, there actually are times when children shouldn't obey their parents. And children... Listen closely. This is not a, a, a card for you to go and say, well, Pastor Travis said I didn't have to obey. Let me tell you when it's appropriate to disobey parents. Paul is not saying that obeying parental orders uh, might be contrary. Or, excuse me. Paul is saying that to obey parental orders that might be contrary to the law of Christ is when you must obey the law of Christ rather than man. We see that all throughout Scripture. In Acts chapter 5, verse 20, 29, Peter and the apostles addressed the leaders who charged them not to speak of Jesus, that they must obey God rather than man. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stand before King Nebuchadnezzar, and King Nebuchadnezzar gives them the charge, fall down and worship this golden image that I've set up, and if you don't fall down and worship it, you're going to be thrown into the fire. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, O King Nebuchadnezzar, we will not bow down and worship this idol that you have set up. Even if it costs us our lives, we worship the Lord God only. And they did. They got thrown into the fire. They disobeyed man to obey God. If obeying man leads us to disobey God, then we must disobey man and obey God. So children, hear me. If you are in the Lord, then you are called to obey your parents because your aim is not simply to please them, but to please and honor God. And by submitting to your parents, you are submitting to Christ. Paul also addressed another member of the family, fathers. Uh, Really, this word in the Greek could mean parents, so it's parents together. Uh, Do not provoke your children, lest they become Discouraged. This word provoke can mean embitter or irritate. Uh, this idea of them becoming discouraged is from this Hellenistic Judaism uh, period. Severe punishment could be meted out for disobedient children. And Paul seems to be addressing the parents not to be so severe in their punishment and overcorrecting their children so that their spirits are broken. That's what that is getting at. It's not to be overbearing that you crush their spirits. And unfortunately, sometimes the obedience of children to parents can be overemphasized. And verse 21 left out. And sometimes verse 21 can be overstressed and verse 20 forgotten about. No correction. No discipline. Children need both. They need to learn to be obedient to their parents, and the parents must reassure their children that they love them and accept them, not based on their actions or lack of actions. I love what N.T. Wright says as he comments on this passage. The Christian father is not to overcorrect or harass his children, or they will become discouraged, which refers to a listless, sullen resignation, a broken spirit. 
To be discouraged as a child means to think things like, I'll never get it right, or all he does is criticize. He'll never love me. And John Newton is reported to have said, I know that my father loved me, but he did not seem to wish me to see it. Christian fathers should be sure their children are as sure of their love as they are of their own authority. What is Paul saying? He's saying from Colossians chapter 3, to put on the mind of Christ, compassionate hearts, meekness, humility, love, forgiving, and let that radiate into the home. Not just between husband and wife, but between parents, children, all those in the household. Let the gospel bear its fruit within the home. Paul is saying that you and I should have a gospel-centered home. Three, or excuse me, two points this morning I want to encourage you with what it means to have a gospel-centered home. Well, the first point is simply this. We're called to live out the gospel in our home. This means putting on compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another, forgiving one another, and above all, putting on love. Parents and children, be Christ-like in the home. Children, submit to your parents as they submit to Christ, being patient with one another, forgiving one another. This is what it means to live out the gospel in your home. Now, I grew up, my father was a disciplinarian, which is a nice way of saying he beat us. Uh, just kidding. We, he, he definitely, we got to a point where, uh, you know, mom would, would, we'd get in trouble at home. My brother and I are about a year apart, and so you can imagine both two rambunctious young little boys, and we just, we, it was just chaotic. I admit it. We were, it was pretty chaos. And, and my poor mom just didn't know what to do, so she would call our father and say, they're acting up, they're doing this. And she would tell us, when your father gets home, you're getting a paddling. And she would say it in a couple of different ways. Um, and so we knew that when dad pulled into the yard, we had a Nissan Frontier, and the, the belt squealed, and so we could hear it coming down uh, the street. And we knew when Dad came, it was time to hide. It's just what it was. He was coming, and he wasn't coming bringing chocolate, right? And, uh, and, and you know, our, my dad, he, he admits that he was wrong in this, but uh, he was one of those type that just kind of grabbed anything that was in sight to use as punishment. Anybody might, uh, you know... I'm not telling you how to parent, but that's probably not the best way to do it, just saying. And so he would grab a belt or whatever it was, and, and he would discipline us. Uh, and he did, of course, what he thought was right. And, and it got to a point where we associated dad coming home with punishment. We associated hearing his truck with, oh, oh no, even if we didn't do anything wrong, we associated that with, here comes dad, and, and what if we did something wrong? You know, and I try to encourage people today, and one of the things me and Megan and I talked about is not doing that, and, and her saying, when your dad gets home, you're gonna, we don't want to create this, 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 this thought of associating dad coming home with, with punishment. No, and one of my greatest joys coming home today, and the kids running down the, the yard and coming up and running up and, and grabbing dad, and, and sometimes they, need, they probably need a spanking when I get home, but uh, we, we try to deal with that differently, and this is just what works for our family. We, we, I try to sit them down and say, hey, uh, you probably shouldn't pun punch your brother in the face, you know? Uh, let's talk about that, and why'd you do it? I don't know. Well, okay, well, let's, let's walk through this, and, and unfortunately, for many of us, our relationship with our earthly fathers affect our relationship with our heavenly father. My father was a disciplinarian, and, and, and he, every little infraction, we got yelled at, disciplined, corrected for. And when I became a believer in Christ, I struggled with the idea that God could forgive me. I struggled with the idea that, that God was merciful, that he had compassion, that, that even though I deserved punishment, he would show grace and mercy because I didn't get it in the home. So what does it mean to have a gospel-centered home? And let me just tell you this, the second point. You need to understand that every parenting moment can be a gospel moment. 
even when they're disobedient. In fact, especially when they're disobedient. Here's what you could say. God, listen, when they mess up, God calls us to obey and not do fill in the blank, punch your brother in the face or do whatever you want to do, fill in the whatever, right? But God is forgiving and full of mercy. Here's what God calls us to do. Confess our wrong to him and ask him to forgive us and he will do it. In fact, this happened this week. Uh, A dear loved one brought some M&M chocolates to uh, Sadie Ruth and Jonathan and and so I gave them a little bit in their hand, and of course, our kids love chocolate uh, a little bit too much, and I'm probably to blame for that. So I gave them a little M&Ms, and they went in the living room, and I put the M&Ms up, little tubes, in a place where I thought they could not get them. That's all me. I thought it was a place they could not get them, and so I'm talking and visiting. Well, I go back, I hear some giggling, I go back in the living room, and there's a mound of M&Ms on the table. Like, they dumped it, both of them out, and they just piled up M&Ms, I'm just like... Sadie Ruth, where do these M&Ms come from? And immediately she goes, buddy. <laughs> and I was like, Sadie Ruth. I looked at her and, and, and I basically in my mind I was like, there's no way your two-year-old brother climbed up and got these M&Ms on the top cabinet, which by the way is possible, right? So, but I knew she did it. She just, I could tell she was lying. I said, Sadie Ruth, are you lying to me? And of course, her, her face got sullen, and she looked down and said, yes. And I said, Sadie Ruth, I got, on, I got on my knees, I got to her high level, and I said, Sadie Ruth, lying is a sin before God. And you could just see the tears welling up. And I wasn't mad, I wasn't upset, I just told her, hey, lying is a sin before God. And I asked her, what do we do when we sin? And she said, we ask Jesus to forgive us. I said, that's right. So what do you need to do? And she prayed and said, Jesus, will you forgive me? Yes. Yes, he will. He's full of grace and mercy and compassion. And 1 John 1, 9 says that if we confess our sins to them, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Is that not what you and I need to hear? When we sin, when we fall, when we mess up, God will forgive you. Turn to him and ask for forgiveness. He is faithful and just to forgive you of all of your sins. And it's what they need to hear as well. They need to understand the gospel. And here's my hope and my aim is that at a young age when she messes up, instead of hiding in guilt and shame, she knows to run to the Father who's full of mercy and compassion and say, will you forgive me? And the answer is yes. Yes. Full of mercy, grace, and compassion. And when we come to him and confess our sins to him, he is faithful to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Isn't that what you and I need to know and remember? And here, it's funny how the only thing that sometimes separates us from our children is age difference. They're sinners in need of grace. And newsflash to you and I, we're sinners in need of grace. And as the recipients of God's mercy and grace, we're called to shower and show that to those around us. How much more to our own household? How much more to our spouse? How much more to our children? Even when they don't deserve it. Because you and I don't deserve it either. But God loves and God forgives. Every parenting moment can be a gospel moment, especially when they're disobedient, even when they're, when they're uh, obedient. Praise them. Hey, Great job. You, you're doing an incredible job and you did this and we're so proud of you and the Lord loves you and he's great. He has mercy for you and grace for you. But above all, reassure them of your love for them no matter their behavior, attitude, or manner. Because even on our worst day, God loves you, 
forgives you and accepts you as his child. (laughs) And aren't you grateful for that? Aren't you grateful that, that God doesn't look at you when you mess up and say, one day you'll figure it out. One day you'll, you'll make it work. I'll just try harder. No. He gives grace. He gives mercy. He walks alongside you, teaches you, comforts you. And we're called to give that, not just to our children, but to all those around us. And here's this beautiful picture. When every member of the household lives out the gospel, there will be compassion, there'll be love, there'll be mercy, there'll be forgiveness. Every day will be a new day where mercies are new. Because every day you and I wake up, mercies are new with the Lord. So my encouragement to you as we continue looking at what it means to be Christ-like in the household is to make the gospel central first in your hearts and paramount in your homes. In your parenting, put on the gospel lens. Let every member of the home be saturated in the good news of Jesus Christ. Does this mean that you're going to be a perfect parent? No. Does this mean you're going to be a, a perfect child who's completely obedient all the time? No. You'll have moments of weakness have moments of failure. But the gospel, the gospel says despite of that, there is good news. In spite of our failure, God meets us. Even in our darkest moments, he meets us, forgives us, cleanses us, cleanses us and washes us and renews us. Most importantly, as we close... <clears throat> I want to remind every one of you who are hearing this message this morning that you need to make the gospel anchored in your heart. Preach it to yourself. It's funny how you and I, we have what Paul David Tripp calls spiritual amnesia. How easily we forget how good and compassionate God is. How easily we get caught up in our mess of a life, our failures. We maximize that and we minimize God's grace and mercy. Some of us believe the lie that we've messed up too many times. We believe the lie that even though we've confessed this sin, we just keep doing it. We just can't get our act together so God is just gonna wash us away. We believe those lies And yet the Bible says otherwise. The Bible comes and says, no, God is merciful. His mercy is new every morning. His faithfulness for you and for me knows no bounds. In fact, not only does he forgive our sins, he remembers them no more. Even though you might remember them, And even though the devil will bring them up and remind you of all your faults and failures, you can look to him and say, yes, I am those things, but Christ paid for them. As Charles Spurgeon would once say, I am a great sinner, but I have a great Savior who is able, who is able even in my darkest of moments to save and redeem me. Stop believing the lies, brothers and sisters. God's mercy for you knows no bounds. His grace for you is new every morning. In fact, one artist would say, if grace is an ocean, we'd all be sinking. First, or John chapter 1, verse 16. By his fullness, speaking of Jesus coming, we have all received grace upon grace. That's what God has for you. And that's what God calls us to walk in, to breathe in, to live in. May that be on the forefront of your mind forevermore. Pray with me. Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. Lord, we thank you for your gospel message, the good news of Jesus coming and paying the debt that we owed 
living the life we should have lived and dying the death that we rightly deserve. But God, you raised him from the dead that those who would place their trust in him could be completely forgiven and freed from the tyranny of sin. Father, may we be people who are reminded day after day of your good works. May we preach the gospel to ourselves. And most importantly, may our homes be saturated with the good news of Jesus Christ. Father, give us wisdom as we walk as sojourners in this world for you. God, give us grace as we fall. And God, remind us of your compassionate mercy and how it's new every single morning. Thank you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, brothers and sisters, as we enter into a time of invitation, um, I want to remind you that we have our prayer or share team in the back. If you need prayer, look, they're right there at the back door. You can just walk back there, and they'd love to, to, to grab your hand and, and lift up any needs you have. Uh, you're more than welcome to come to these stairs and bow the knee as an altar to worship before the Lord. If maybe for the first time you're hearing about what it means to be in Christ to, to accept this gospel, this good news of what Jesus did for us. You, come forward. I'd love to talk with you what it means to follow Christ, to give your life to him, to trust him and be saved from your sins. But I encourage all of us this morning, as a reminder of God's goodness to us, that we will respond in worship. So let's stand and worship our great God.
we turn our eyes to you. Amen. Maybe seated just for a few moments, uh, a few announcements as we close. I uh, want to encourage you, remind you, uh, next week starts our Easter festivities with uh, the Palm Sunday. So I encourage you to be a part of that. You can see these flyers. Uh, hey, I want to challenge you. Just you know somebody, give them a flyer, invite them to church, invite them to Easter Sunday. Not just Easter, but invite them to church. Um, so I want to encourage you that. I don't normally do this, but I want to uh, make you aware of a resource Um, kind of alluded to a lot of that this morning. Paul David Tripp wrote a book called Parenting, 14 Gospel Principles That Can Radically Change Your Family. So in the uh, resource area, the back in the foyer here, uh, to the right of the men's restroom, there is, uh, it's kind of cool, we have uh, recommendations for reading. I have a slot Corey has a slot, Tyler has a slot, there's even a pastor's wives slot, which we vetted, it's not heresy, I'm just kidding, Uh, no, it's good, Um, and so I'm going to put this book there, and so you can look at it, flip through it, uh, but it's a great resource uh, just to think biblically and parenting, and and so if you know, it's a good gift for somebody, if you you know parents or your grandparents want to get it to children, it's just an incredible resource, Uh, but hey, listen, Let me remind you again, God loves you. His mercy for you is new every morning. He's faithful. We know that even in our darkest moments and deepest heartaches, he works all things together for good for those who are calling according to his purpose. That means that he also cares for you. May you and I continue walking and living in that reality this week. Let's pray. Father, we thank you once again for your grace and mercy. Father, we lift up the name of Jesus, knowing he draws people to himself. Father, may you be glorified. May we live for you in all things. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord, all ye heavenly hosts.